Lee, thanks for coming on the podcast, man, and sharing your insights into the world of sport. No problem at all, Coots. Thanks for having me. Mate, 1992, correct me if you're wrong, you're 22 years old. You're about to jet off to Spain, Barcelona for the 1992 Olympics. Man, that must have been an incredibly proud moment for yourself and your family at such a young age. And to be able to march and do all the ceremonies whilst playing on a global on a global stage, you must be incredibly proud for yourself. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, playing um, junior hockey in Warwick and then moving over to Perth to go to the AIS. So it, it didn't seem to be anything really special at the moment. It was just something that you really enjoyed doing. And then um, you, you get caught up in the training and the activity and, and then you're, you're heading off to an Olympic Games, as you said. And um, it, was, it was kind of surreal because you didn't feel like you know, people talk about sacrifices, things like that. You know, they're just choices that you make along your way. So that leading into Barcelona was a big moment that, oddly enough, was was almost ruined in a, a pretty stupid act that uh, when we got to Barcelona in the village, because there's no traffic and no cars, there's just a few buses and that, mm. we bought skateboards to get around the village. And um, there was the captain, the goalkeeper, my best mate, Stephen Davies, and myself, we just get around on skateboards and... I fell off and broke my collarbone. So ten didn't, days out, yeah. Didn't play half the half the tournament. Well, no, that was uh, ten days out, and the medical staff uh, they said, "No, we'll we'll get you, we'll get you right." And it wasn't broken in the in halfway through the collarbone; it was in the joint. So they just uh, immobilised the joint and we- weaved their magic and got me on the field. So it was pretty pretty incredible. One of the the, the issues was I didn't get to to march in the opening ceremony. For obviously rehab reasons but the whole team didn't march either because the morning after the opening ceremony we had to play at 8 30 it was the first game of the barcelona olympics mm. and so you've got to be up at 5 a.m and one of our guys marched ash Carey, who's another queenslander just because he was so hell-bent on marching that it would have been detrimental to him <laughs> mentally not to march so we agreed you can march and he didn't get home until like 2 a.m so oh, wow. and but he was our best player the next day so yeah he knew yeah, he had to make it up the um the march in my eyes, it's it's definitely a moment that, as an athlete, I would absolutely want to do. Was there a difference when you were coaching for USA in uh, the 2008 2012 Olympics compared to the Australian one with the march? Was there an, there was there an aura or an atmosphere with it? Yeah, the straight away when you're in the Olympic the US Olympic movement, you know, there's a lot more uh, luxuries that are afforded to you from the IOC. So where you sit in the village, you you mm. um, you're right beside the dining hall. You know, extra accreditation for athletes and staff there is a, a little bit more that is afforded to the u.s group but um getting i was really excited to march with the u.s team because i didn't enjoy, uh, witness it as a as an athlete and i wanted to find out what it was like and i sort of didn't know if it was going to be different coaching another country and being involved with them but um i, I will never forget being in the tunnel um walking down and because we had the, the u.s women's team and you know, walking alongside us is Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, you know, so there's already surreal moments within that. But we're walking in the tunnel just about to come out um, and they start the the USA chant. Mm. And even now I get goosebumps. I'm not American at all, but that moment where it's just echoing through and I'm thinking if you're the team in front and the team in back and you've got 400 you athletes that. cheering this chant, yeah, it it, it is um, – it's emotional. It really is. You walk out and, of course – the Beijing being the first one, um, the the stadium's full and that they did such a good job, the Chinese, with the opening ceremony and the whole Olympics for that matter. Um, yeah, it's it's something I'll never forget. So that was 2008 and going back to your playing days in 92, there was, um, look, hockey isn't Australia's main sport and we all know that. And I think in my eyes that there's, there's an extra bit of pressure um, for yourself on a global impact because... Everyone is watching the Kookaburras because that's where the that's where all the shining lights going to be, um, especially at the Olympics when we don't really watch them on TV regularly. Was there was there a pressure to perform at such a global stage as well? Yeah, well and truly, and and it, it's and how do you deal with that? Should I say? Yeah, look, we um, where the pressure came from was you know the seventy six Olympics. Um, they won the silver medal, beaten by New Zealand, which was you know. Unheard of at the time, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. the start of the monkey then, uh, obviously didn't play Moscow, 84, ranked number one in the world, had won everything, missed out on a medal, win a World Cup in 86, go to the 88 games, number one, didn't, came back with nothing, so the, the pressure was there, we addressed it in 
in a way collectively as a group that, you know, we didn't play in 88, we didn't play in 84, this is a different group, we don't carry those burdens. But it's still there. You know, it was mm. like um, the Queensland Sheffield Shield team at the time that hadn't won a Shield um, for so many years. And um, we felt that uh, that was a similar um, sporting antidote. Um, and we, we addressed it. And one of the, the things for us going into the Barcelona Olympics is we weren't number one, we were number four in the world at the time. Yep. So straight away we had a disconnect with that that um, monkey, as I said, that you know, you're number one, you, pr- you promise everything. But you know, now here we are, um, hockey's the most successful Olympic sport for Australia. Mm. So we... Uh, big we turnaround. F- yeah, big turnaround. There's... um. Especially in today's day and age, there's heaps of analytics and data around enhancing performance, and you're massive on performance enhancement yourself. Was there any methods of preparation, discipline, or anything like that back in your day to get yourself ready for games? Yeah, there was a, there's probably the the real start of the performance support teams was coming into that. You know, obviously with the the creation of the the Australian Institute of Sport and you know, mm. professional you know full time employees coming into um, Olympic sports, uh, there was a real emphasis around you know, your your physiological preparations, you know your anaerobic and aerobic, aerobic platforms that you were um, developing, um, the use of uh, energy systems that was you know now with the scientific proven. Uh, tangible testing outcomes that you could have. So that was all starting to come in, you know, weights programs, which was, you know, for our sport, Didn't non-existent. Yeah. So they're all, they're all coming in and uh, it, it was something that um, you could see evolve. You know, I was, I was in the, the national team from, um, what was it, 91 through to 98. And even in that, that eight-year period, you could tell just the advancements that were coming into it. Mm. And I didn't notice it as much because it was, you know, as I spoke earlier, you're just doing what you enjoy and, you know, you're told to turn up for training, you're told to lift this and run that, so you did. Um, but when I got to the, the Olympic, uh, the USOC, um, you know, it was like Australia were about 10 years in front with our um, development of our athletes in that performance support space. So, mm. um, yeah, we were right at the cutting edge of it and... Yeah, it was it was great to be a part of it because you knew you were getting the best um, in your preparation. Silver medal in '92 with the with the Kookaburras. Fast track to 2005. You, you're now the head coach of the USA Women's Team. Was there was there a part of you that didn't want to take the job purely because you know that we're, you're a different country, you're representing a different country, but obviously it's the highest role you could possibly have at the time. Yeah, again, I, I think it was a pivotal moment around sport where coaches were deemed to be professional, you know, loyalties and things like that were starting to dilute. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you're a professional coach. You know, you look at um, someone like Eddie Jones now, which is topical. You know, he's – talk about Japan, he's coached in England, yep. Australia, all those things. So you're more or less a professional coach. And that was starting to come in at that time. Um, oddly enough, I was offered the job to be the head coach of the men's program at the QIS – for hockey and um, and got this offer to go to the States. And um, I had a young family, um, well, an uh, 18-month-old son. Um, and one of the things I didn't take advantage of in my playing days, I was offered to go and play in Holland um, towards the end of my career. And playing hockey for so long, I thought, I'll get married, I'll start working properly and do those mm. sort of things. And I didn't take advantage of it. And I won't say I regretted it, but here's my opportunity to now do it. Um, Good job. US, um, really excited about going to the US. Sporting culture, I thought, was similar, so I didn't think there was going to be too much of a challenge in that area. But mm. uh, a- And an opportunity to go in there. They hadn't qualified for the previous two Olympic Games and to go in there and, and qualify for Beijing and, and take them forward into that. Well, they, they actually hadn't qualified for a Games and since uh, 88, I think it was. Yeah, so mm. we really had a good opportunity to go forward. There's different parts about sport as a player and a coach um, to become successful and, and you've you sort of tapped into both there. And you mentioned Eddie Jones as well because I was talking to a few other um, people I've interviewed about Eddie Jones and the way that he manages his players and player relations. And I was talking about Wayne Bennett and emotional intelligence and how some people need an arm around the shoulder and some people need to be yelled at. How important for you is just like having that player relation and knowing your player and what you can get out of your player and... To be successful. It's massive. I, I think um, your player management is critical to your successes. I mean, ultimately, um, especially in our sport, understanding the reasons why they're doing it, you know, first and foremost, it's it's for enjoyment and then mm. 
you know, they want to be successful within what they're allocating so many hours to to training. And uh, I look, I probably didn't have a good experience around the coach relationship when I was in the national team. Um, I, the coach was a little bit old school, you know, a lot of fire and brimstone, and and not no real rapport with the athletes, you know, mm. and. and which, which was disappointing because it was, you know, you, you'd play a tournament, you'd go and you'd have success and to not be able to sit down and, and maybe have a beer and talk about and celebrate with your coach, I think I felt that there was a part missing because it was removing that, that real team dynamic and taking that into those lessons from as an athlete, that served me really well um, working with the, the US team around identifying what it is that they want to achieve and then... Um, having a rapport with the athletes to a degree that the understanding that one day you're going to have to tell them that their Olympic dream's over. Mm. And so you've got to find that fine balance between um, getting along with your athletes to avoiding that, that real bonding friendship that at one stage you're going to have to break. So the management of the athletes, the, the empathy for their plight, um, understanding that you know in our sport there's not a lot of money, so... If they've got to go and they've got to do a work shift or they've got to do something like that, they've got to look after a, a, a relative, you know, you've got to allow those things to come into their, their training schedules with the understanding that you know they're going to want to make that up down the track. Mm. Um, so yeah, that management of the athletes and giving them ownership of, of how they go about achieving their successes and us providing the vehicle and the knowledge um, is something that I really took forward out of my playing days and – try to encourage as a, as a coach. Mate, and on top of that, the approach and the preparation is so important as a coach and as a player as well. Was there any similarities or a main difference with your preparation as a coach and as a player? Yeah, massive, massive. It was one of the biggest uh, changes that I noticed, the, the separation between the player and the coach. The player, you just turn up and play. Mm. Now, that was it. Um, as a coach, you, there's so much that goes on around scouting, um, organising, preparation, um, as I said, that player management, you know, you just had to look after yourself as a player, you know, within that team dynamic and, and get yourself ready the best way that you could. Um, so, yeah, going into the, the coaching dynamic, it was massive. Um, going into the village, you didn't get uh, – going into the Olympics, you didn't get to see a lot of the Olympics because you, you're just so busy yeah. um, behind the scenes getting everything ready so that the player could just turn up and do their best mm. and – one of the things it was simple for me was um, the delegation of, of support within our, our performance support team. So, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a physio, I'm not a psych, I'm not a nutritionist. You know, all these things that I could just delegate over to the professionals that they would manage within our, 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 our daily training environment and then um, passing on roles and responsibilities within our um, assistant coaches, getting them to help me help the athletes was something that uh, I learned very on early on in my coaching mm. um, through our high performance manager Terry Walsh. She was actually my um, last playing coach that I had, who was was very good, and I, I had a good rapport with him. Mm. I had um, I had Michael Blucher on, and he um, he was talking about obviously he does a lot of consultancy work with athletes, and he was talking about after the the, the crowd stops cheering and after life and how much support athletes need after after footy life and what they need to do after life to succeed as well. And as a coach, mate, it, it, I think it's important that we pave the way for our athletes after after their career is done as well. Was there is there any tips or approach that you take to help support your athletes after their, their career as well? Yeah, it, it is. And it, it's a lesson that I learned as an athlete. Like I, I you mentioned, I, as a 22-year-old, I went to Barcelona. Mm. I didn't go to another Olympics. Like I was dropped for the 96 um, when I thought I was coming into my prime and would go and have success. And mm. and to not make it, that was, as I said, at that moment, that was my whole world, just gone. Yeah, And it was devastating. It took a long time um, to, to move on. And, and I was really fortunate. I had really good people around me who... Um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she was there that more or less it said, this is a beginning, not an end. Yeah, and yeah. so kicked me in the bum, sent me out, got a great job working in sports apparel and, and you know, that's one of the things I was still involved in with today. So what I learned out of that was the it's not about the, the cure, it's about the prevention. And so um, in our daily training environment in the States, we were very active in setting athletes up for life around away from the sport. So mm. in our program, you had to work and, and a proper job you know, that would um, 
through the the sponsors that you have in the the USOC that you could get um, paid internships where you work twenty hours and get paid for forty and and those sort of scenarios. Um, a lot of our athletes because it was. Um, an NCAA sport in America. Um, they're coming out a really good college program, so they they were studying or or, or working forward to degrees. Mm. Um, so that that was the the, the biggest thing that we encouraged because, as I said, it will come to an end, and we highlighted that. You know, as good as it is now, we we're we we're training in San Diego. You know, living on the beaches. They they had a a good time, but you know there was hard work involved. But we just continually promoted that. You know, it, it will stop and you need to be set up now to make sure that that transition is as seamless as it can be. You know, it's not without, you know, athletes slipping through the cracks because, you know, like myself, you know, a lot of them don't see the non-selection coming mm-hmm. and therefore, you know, it's the major shock. Um, but, you know, if that drop is caught by, you know, a finance degree or a law degree or something like that, that they then move straight into that um, stage of their life then you move on it must be something that you're still reiterating with athletes nowadays and and the rise of women's sport especially um in our country and you can you can just see with the products of like the nrlw the afl the, the, the cricket even they're they're just smashing out um and it's just it's just rising the, the at the talent level of women's sport was there as a, as a coach who's been coaching women's sport for over 20 years now, is there a, is there a difference appro- in approach for coaching the girls compared to when maybe you were being coached in the men's team as well? Yeah, there is a lot. There's a lot of difference between coaching male athletes and, and female athletes. And, you know, communication is a big part. Um, the How you communicate with the athlete. Um, as I said, the, the empathy for their plight. You know, the female athletes, they... Um, now it's become a, a career path, like mm. you're saying, with cricket and uh, AFLW and NRLW. You excel in a sport. You can earn a lot of money and have a career out of doing that. Um, initially, that was, you know, you uh, female out there, oh, am I putting my family life on hold or what am I doing in that space? But now, um, well, two weekends ago, we took a team to Darwin um, in preparation for our Hockey One season um, and – the goalkeeper has a eight month old baby. So mm. straight away, um, our CEO, uh, Alison Lyons, very progressive in that space. We paid for her husband to come, the child to go on the tour, obviously, uh, a room, um, you know, simple things like uh, having child restraint chairs in the, in the car, you know. Mm. So um, being accommodating so that the female athletes now can pursue their, their, um, their sporting goals as long as they can and they're not feeling that they're putting stuff on hold. So um, there, there's great opportunity in there. And oddly enough, I've just come from a, a women's in sport breakfast. So um, some of the the, 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 um, the forward thinking coming out of these areas around the, the I don't want to say the word equality on it, but it, it's more around um, the, the, the evolution of the women's sport getting greater profile and notoriety and therefore financial advantages to it, mm. I think is is something that uh, it's very exciting at the moment because ultimately, you know, in Australia, we want sport everywhere. So, mm. yeah. you know, having female success and male success, um, it doesn't matter. We just want them all doing well. My coaching now, especially um, in today's day and age, the media is such a, an important part of it. And I've had Terry Svensson and Bluch come on and they were all talking about image and personal brand and – and the qualities and the, and the leadership that we want to pursue our brand um, to the fans. How much importance do you tell your players about having a good personal image on social media and maybe provide a bit of an, in, an intel about someone who maybe has stuffed up on social media and how you've been able to manage that? Yeah, look, we, we're very active and it is the, the new athlete, you know, your, your social footprint sort of thing and, and mm. how you're doing it. And we at uh, at Hockey Queensland, I, I think we bat well above our, our um, where we sit within the sporting landscape around our social media awareness, and it's a massive area for us. And um, we, we've got um, a, a whole department around that that's centred to it, and they're doing an extremely good job. Um, and of course, with the the athletes that are coming in, they're seeing this, so they they've got immediate buy in. Because you know they get promoted, they get some mm. notoriety. People know who they are, yeah. Um, and and it's working extremely well for us. So that in itself is is massive. Um, what we're also witnessing within that is 
you know, through CEOs and um, journalists and, and more females getting you know, the recognition in these areas yeah. um, and, and filling these roles, that that's also transferring into an elevation of the women's in sport, women in sport as well. So um, having that happen, getting you know, females in those roles is great. Um, social media, it's a tricky one. Um, you can, you know, one slight move around interpretation. Mm. Um, and we had, we had a situation, I, I mean, this was in the, the, the media, we had Rosie Malone, who's a fantastic athlete. You know, she's, um, was at the Tokyo Olympics, she's done really well. Um, she's very prominent on social media and just, you know, promoting skills and, mm. You know, tours and stuff that she does, she, she's got a good skill set. Um, and she posted a, a video of, um, I think it was a, an English athlete at the Olympics who was you know, chiseled, cut, and, you know, I, I forget what the comment was around it, but mm. um, it, was, it was deemed, you know, an in, inappropriate comment, which you know, was probably a little bit oversensitive at the time. Mm. But, you know, because somebody's raised it, you know, if, if one person's raised this with the – Becoming an issue. Yeah, it's become an issue. So then, then you get a please explain, and then you've got an athlete that's got um, in an Olympic village or a Commonwealth Games um, scenario, um, feeling like she's done the wrong thing, and so now you've got a distraction to performance. So, mm -hmm. as good as it can be to you know, maximise your profile, you know, any slight mistake that brings about you know a please explain, and you can be taken off task in one fell swoop. So. Um, the education piece is massive and we, and we do spend a lot of time with our athletes, not just at the top level, but um, under 13s and under 15s because they're all, all in and around it. Mm. Um, you know, one inappropriate TikTok and that's reflected if you're wearing a Hockey Queensland uniform, that comes straight back to the organisation. Yep. So they're very active in the education piece. Um, every year before you go on tours, there's an education component, um, both – um, from our um, our social me uh, media uh, department, but equally, um, you know, we've got members of the Queensland Police Service as well that also educate around do's and don'ts mm. in those areas. So it's pretty it's pretty intensive. You, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on education, that's for sure. And what what do you say to a player if if they've if they've done something like that and then they're feeling down or there's there's emotional factor towards a game if it's in a big game like an Olympics? What do you say as a coach? To that player, yeah. Oh, look, I again, I'm I'm not a psych, so we we recognise it. We put them in the right channels of, of support, mm. work with them. Um, we we explain that they're, they're not performance based, and there's and there's different levels. You know, if if they're you know posting something very derogatory and and totally unacceptable, well, then there's consequences to that because they fit outside our values. Mm. So there are consequences to gauging on um, the level of the breach. Um, in the social media space, if it's something you know w which we seem you know, might be inadvertent or innocuous and you know just you know, a silly mistake, yeah, yeah, you know, we we look at our education processes and how did that get through first, mm. and then we look at them and go, well, okay, no, this is something that's egregious. Um, there, there's consequences around that, um, but yeah, we we sit down and, and work with them. The the fortunate thing for me in in the sport of hockey, you know, we. Uh, um, our cultural values are very strong and, and, again, that education component around what we have, hashtag Team Queensland, you know, they know what they're getting into and what's expected. So yeah. um, I think the biggest fear around the performance is, you know, oh, geez, I've broken something that's really strong here. Are there going to be consequences with them? But, you know, we sit down and we work through it with them and yeah. um, th there's lessons along the way. Um I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm glad there weren't phones and all that when I was yeah, coming absolutely. through as an athlete. But, uh, you know, to err and, and, you know, make a mistake is is one thing. But, you know, I don't think you get kicked to the curb because of it. Mate, you base your success, obviously, on how the team performs. Is there any what other method of how you base your success as a coach or as a player even? Yeah, oh, well, it's as a player, it's relatively easy you know you, you look at your successes on what you're able to achieve and mm. and I think that's again in that what I was saying earlier as a player you prepare yourself you turn up you contribute as best you can um, and then the success of the group is determined accordingly so you have pretty tangible um, measures around how successful you are as an athlete um, when it comes to a coach I, I look at it in so many ways you know it's it's not 
uh, wins and losses as much, um, although that's what you're aspiring to do. Uh, it's also around, you know, what is, what's the quality of the person that's, that's left your program when they've come through, you know, mm. have they achieved their successes? Are they, are they better people? Are they, you know, more balanced in their life, lifestyles and life choices? You know, where, where do they end up? There's nothing more satisfying now than um, stepping away from the, the US role and, and still remaining, you know, Facebook friends and connected on socials and all that and seeing the successes that they're enjoying, you know, some that have got into coaching again and you, you hope that some of your successes and values are being carried through mm. uh, in the positive way, not like my experience that was the, the anti um, of what you experienced, but uh, you hope that that's what's happening. You know, having athletes reach out and ask for advice, you know, again, um, that that gives you a very proud moment about what you're able to achieve and, and pass on. So, yeah, you do want your wins and losses, well, your wins to be more than your losses, um, but a, as a coach, I think you have more of a responsibility around um, your processes and, and how you're going to achieve those things. And and I've been really fortunate now um, in my time at Hockey Queensland that um, our uh, involvement and relationship with the Queensland Academy of Sport has uh, accelerated um, yeah. quite significantly and, and we've got you know some of the best service providers in the country that are working with our male and female athletes and you know even that in itself knowing from where we were to where we are and knowing that the athletes now are getting the best support in those areas it, you know that's a, a pleasing accomplishment again as a coach to know that that's that's what's happening I might just finish on this because you've had such an illustrious career um, as a player and a coach. What's been the best moment or best highlight for you? Could you narrow it down? Oh, I've got a friend of mine, that, um, Stephen Davies, who we moved to Perth together. Um, we went to the Olympics together um, and you know, still you know, he rang me before I came in here. Um, he got asked this question. He thought it was the greatest moment. He said the first day he put on the Australian shirt mm. and the – journalist asking the question yeah okay well what what other than that he said every moment since then that i pulled the shirt on and I, that always resonated with me you know you, you as i mentioned you play the sport um because you enjoy it then you get this reward of um re- representing your country and and that that moment i still would never forget it you know the first test match that i played um in france against france and looking down and seeing the coat of arms on your shirt, mm. it, that's when it really hit home and you knew, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, standing on the, on the dais in Barcelona, um, as you mentioned, as a 22-year-old, there were athletes on there, senior athletes, that had suffered the disappointment of previous games and to not win the gold medal, they were down. I'm 22-year-old, I'm up the back, big yeah. grin on my face, <laughs> silver medal, you're beauty, how good is this? Um, so that was that was pretty pleasing. Um, from a coaching side of thing, uh, um, going to the Olympic qualifier in Kazan in Russia with the the US girls, knowing that they hadn't qualified um, for a very very long time. There was our, our captain that I coaxed out of retirement because she'd tried twice and and not qualified. And I said, look, just give it one more crack with me and see how we go. And and. One of the advantages of being in the Australian Hockey Network, we we expected to go to the Olympics. Mm. Like it was where we finished that was the issue. Yeah. Um. So I went to this Olympic qualifying tournament with a bit of Australian hockey arrogance around that I expect us to win and qualify for the Olympics, but it's they had the complete opposite. Yeah. Where the USA we've fallen at the last bullet step at the last couple of times, and and I'll never forget um, sharing the moment with my assistant coach Stephen Davy uh, Stephen Jennings who I played against uh, as a US player um, and he'd gone through the same as a coach, assistant coach in those previous campaigns and knowing that we'd beaten Belgium 3-1 in the final of Olympic qualifier in Kazan, Russia, knowing that we were going through to Beijing and that was probably the real satisfying moment because of how much work we'd put in to the absence of that euphoria for the US group. That was satisfying to just sit back in the room back at the hotel with all their family and friends mm. um, and know that they're finally getting the opportunity to go to the Olympics. And that was, that was a massive moment. And the beauty for me was, as I mentioned, going to London, um, having my wife and two boys there in the crowd as part of the US supporter group. Um, you know, that's, 
being able to share those moments with your family is is massive and you know it, it's good to to reflect on that every now and again with them as well well Lee, thank you so much for coming on the podcast man sharing your insight into the life of hockey and life itself um it's been an absolute pleasure mate so thank you very much cheers i really enjoyed it thanks very much no